Uh, my yeah. name is Eric Demain. No, no, no. My name's Eric Demain. You're Marty. Remember? See? You got right. This is a father-son team, and Eric is the father. Uh, you're the son, I guess. Um, if we could go to slides. And, uh, we want to talk today about uh, connections between art and math. Uh, as you heard, we do both art and math. Marty's background is more in the arts, mine is more in the math, but we do both together. We work a lot together. And we found over the years, it, you should move a little, your head's blocking the uh -huh. screen. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we found over the years that actually art and math are really kind of the same thing. They've been converging more and more uh, over the years. And uh, we want to tell you a little story about that. Uh, my background is varied in art. One of the first things I did was glass blowing. I'm actually called the father of glass blowing in Canada uh, from the early 70s. And this is some early work that was done then. This and is all before I was born. Uh, then I was born, and our first collaboration was when I was five years old. That's me on the left. Uh, I look a little different. Marty's about the same. <laughs> and uh, we had a, a, a company together called the Eric and Dad Puzzle Company, and we sold puzzles uh, to toy stores across Canada. It was an exciting collaboration. Eric did these incredible designs. Then he got me to do all the work making them. <laughs> um, then uh, when I was ages 7 to 11, so a period of four years, we lived in, traveled around the U.S. and uh, lived in 10 different places uh, for fun, basically, exploring all sorts of different areas, and we ended back in Halifax, in the top right, where I was born. Uh, when I was 12, I went to university. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I became a single parent when Eric was two years old, and it changed my life dramatically. I became a daycare worker, so I could understand about how children think and, and learn. And so part of this travel was to educate Eric through travel, and it was... Uh, uh, an amazing experience because we met so many people along the way. And because we were traveling, we were sort of forced initially to try out homeschool, and that turned out to work really well. And, and uh, so we continued throughout, even when we were staying for a couple years at a time. Homeschool was just a really great way to learn uh, from each other, to learn whatever it is we wanted to learn, and to learn from our neighbors and people who happened to be around, who had different kinds of background, different. Uh, they just knew different things, and so we could learn from whoever was around us. And that was really powerful, and it influences us today in the way that we collaborate in our mathematics. In particular, we've written papers with uh, about 250 people. Uh, you can check if your name is there. I saw one of them was mentioned in a talk yesterday. So it's, it's a lot of fun to work with, with lots of people. You know, two heads is better than one. You can just solve bigger problems when you work with people who know different things. And we work a lot together. We've written 60-some uh, papers together uh, on the math side. And we also work together on the art side. So this is some of our latest work. It's exciting to me that Eric has taken an interest in glass. And we tried to do kind of different forms, a little bit puzzling maybe to some early glass blowers. And there's kind of a, a kinetic movement uh, effect that we're trying to incorporate in glass. And initially, it was just so cool to see you blow glass, because that was all, mostly before I was born. And at MIT, there's a glass studio, and so we got to play together. Um, and we also like to have fun with what we do, and uh, at, at all levels, and sort of the playful humor side. We think math should have more humor in it. So this is a little video that we made uh, that illustrates a key mathematical concept that we used in a paper, uh, but in a, in, a, in a way you can all understand. The dice rolling, the we movie. We like to get immersed in our research. Total immersion. I'm going to climb inside and learn dice rolling from the inside out. We're starting in this position. We're going to end in this position, but with a different orientation. We're starting in the one, two, three orientation. Remember that. Are you ready to roll, Dad? Ready. Let's do it. Roll number one. All right, we'll see that we are back in our original
original position. Now, with the numbers 1, 4, and 5, with 5 on top instead of 1. Ta-da! Remember, I'm a trained professional. <laughs> so, notice no padding in the box, no special effects. <laughs> I, I refused. Uh, <laughs> I'm a couple inches shorter after doing that little video. <laughs> and and you know, if I set up the video, I'm like, what, what do you want to do a second take? <laughs> <laughs> he refused for some reason. <laughs> um, all right, so that's uh, humor in mathematics. Um, we, we study a lot the mathematics of paper folding and origami, and that's why you all have your handouts and, and we're part of the origami theme that you've seen. Uh, uh, origami has had this amazing revolution in the last uh, several years, and you've seen some of the products, people like Brian Chan designing amazing figures. All of this is made possible through mathematics, partly from mathematics. Because we understand the mathematics and algorithms behind paper folding, work uh, like by Robert Lang and his tree theory, uh, is the basis for a lot of origami design. And it's really exciting. So let's tell you, uh, right, and it's also the subject of uh, this documentary, which you should all see. It's really cool, Between the Folds. And uh, Vanessa Gould, the director, will be talking uh, shortly after us. Uh, so let's tell you a little bit about uh, the theory of origami. Uh, one early result, which we did together with a colleague uh, back in 99, is that you can make anything in theory. You take a large enough square of paper, you can fold yourself a horse. If your paper is white on one side, black on the other, you can fold a zebra. You can fold a 3D horse. Anything is possible. The sky is the limit. It's good news for origamis. A great result, but unfortunately this re result doesn't tell us how to do it efficiently. Yeah, it doesn't really give practical foldings. It starts from a giant piece of paper and folds a microscopic horse. Uh, but recently we've been making progress on how to actually do this efficiently where you start with some 3D model you design on your computer or whatever, like this uh, classic bunny in the bottom, and you get a crease pattern, like on the left, that says you just fold this way, and boom, you get exactly, <laughs> <laughs> admittedly a little difficult, and uh, you're, you're experiencing that maybe with your, with your handout. Um, but it can be done, and the thing on the right is a photograph, and it's exactly the thing that you desire. And this is called Organizer. It's work with a Japanese architect, actually, uh, Tomohiro Tachi. And uh, it, lets, it will hopefully open a whole new world of artistic origami design. That's the, the hope. But this is brand new stuff. OK, one of the things we also like to study is magic. There's, uh, Houdini was not always an escape artist. At one time, he was a general magician. And he wrote this book about paper magic. And one of the parts about the magic was how to cut fold and cut paper to get specific shapes. Well, just one shape. So I'm going to take here uh, a little rectangle of paper and fold it flat. And if we could switch to a uh, video camera so you can see this. Uh, maybe you want to come and uh, do some cutting ah. for me. So we fold. We're going to make one complete straight cut. Cut, cut straight now. This line? Uh, yeah. No, 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 not that line. <laughs> uh, uh, and we're going to get uh, six pieces. You can have some uh, to unfold. Very exciting. These are isosceles triangles. Ooh. Somehow that never impresses people. And then we have uh, everything except the isosceles triangle. It's a little cooler. All right, you're not impressed, though. Uh, <laughs> we can do some more. You want to cut this one? Yeah, it's a little yeah. easier. All right. All right. And we have, sorry. <laughs> we have a little, little swan here. OK. Uh, we'll do one more. <laughs> this is fun. You guys, you guys are such a good audience. Uh, it's tough being surrounded by you know real magicians. <laughs> uh, we are just mathematical magicians, but a lot of magic is based on math. Here, this little angelfish. All right. Uh, actually, well, you, you've already seen this one, so maybe I'll just show you what it looks like when you folded it successfully. Uh, it looks like that, and make one cut. This one, that's great. They're, they're identical. Isn't this a great symmetry between E and G? It's kind of <laughs> part of the design, I'm sure. All right, so you can impress your, your friends at home. We'll go back to slides. 
uh, by, by folding in one straight cut. Very cool. The general theorem is you can make anything you want. You just uh, take whatever shapes you want, fold, make one straight cut. Uh, a computer will tell you how to fold and where to cut, and boom, you get your shapes and your magic trick. Uh, this is an early result that we had. What's exciting about it, as recreational as it sounds, it turns out to have applications in designing airbags. The kind of folding that we use helps make safer airbags. So it's a good example to tell young people that any problem can have an application later on. Right, we started just exploring the magic of paper folding. It seemed like a fun problem. Houdini did it, why shouldn't we? Uh, but it, now origami saves lives, and that was a total surprise and something we could not anticipate. So that's the, part of the fun of mathematics. Uh, there's your EG. Uh, the last story we wanted to tell you about is uh, called pleat folding. And this is a project we've been working on for uh, 11 years, since the beginning, pretty much. And it's, it's especially fun because it uh, has alternated from, oh, hang, we can hold this the right way and not burn somebody, from art to math to art to math to art to math to art. And we found it really powerful for us to explore both the art and the mathematical angles of, of the same problem uh, together. Because whenever we get stuck on the mathematics, we can switch over and build a sculpture that illustrates why that mathematics is so interesting, so difficult. And whenever we get stuck on a sculpture, we can go back and study the mathematics of it and try to get clues on how to build it better. Yeah, just this, this co-evolution of the two fields, they just they inspire each other. And we encourage you all to, to try the same. Don't confine yourself to one particular aspect. Do anything that you enjoy. Sometimes they're getting so close now that we can't tell them apart, just like Mike was mentioning. Yeah. Uh, so our story starts with a hyperbolic paraboloid. Here's one. If you want to demo that. Um, I'm a model. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very simple model. You should all try it out. It's very cool. Uh, you just take a square of paper, fold concentric squares, alternating mountain and valley, fold the diagonals, and it pops into this saddle shape all by itself, sort of self-folding origami. It's really cool. Uh, it goes back to the Bauhaus in the late 20s. And you can, uh, if we go back to the slides, sorry, uh, you can uh, do it with circles too. It's a little harder. You need like a compass or a laser cutter or something. Uh, but if you crease concentric circles alternating mountain and valley, you get another saddle shape. You have to cut a little hole out of the center. Uh, also goes back to the Bauhaus in the late 20s. So you know, these have been around for a while. Thought it would be fun to experiment with them. And so we design, to build sculpture with them, we design an algorithm that you give as input a polyhedron, like in the top middle there is a cube. Um, and to represent that cube, it says here's a particular way to join together a whole bunch of hyperbolic paraboloids that, that uh, come from the cube. There's 24 of them. And you pick your favorite polyhedron, it says here's a new sculpture, and you go and build it. These are photographs of things that we folded. So in, in principle, there's an infinite family of sculptures, and we've only made finitely many so far. But we're planning to do the infinite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always set your goals high, right? So this was our first uh, work in this area. It's on the artistic side, the sculpture side, but we're using mathematics as a tool. Uh, if we go to, uh, actually, let's solve a mathematical problem. Uh, why does paper fold into that shape? Why does it make that hyperbolic paraboloid and not something else? Uh, and so to understand that, we, we simulated what origami does. And the top three examples are, are real photographs of, of folded paper. The bottom three, as you might notice, are, are computer simulations, but they match. And what's going on, here's a, an example with uh, concentric hexagons. What's going on is the paper, wherever it's creased, it wants to be bent, and wherever it's not creased, it wants to stay as flat as possible. And these are sort of the equilibrium subject to all of those physical forces. Once you have a, a virtual model of paper, the natural thing to do is to make a physical sculpture of a virtual model of the physical piece of paper. <laughs> Go full circle. Uh, and so this is um, a bunch of 3D printed spheres with holes at just the right angles so that aluminum rods make the creases in that hexagon. This so. one's currently a meter in size, and the plan is to build some of these larger as playground structures. It could be a lot of fun. Okay, so that's on the sculpture side. We go back to mathematics. This hyperbolic parabola we've been studying for 10, 11 years. Uh, we just proved last year doesn't even exist. Uh -huh. Imagine, I have the impossible right here. 
We should all go and make one and defy mathematics. But we proved that it's impossible to fold that crease pattern into anything. Uh, you have to add creases or cheat or stretch or something. Something weird is happening here. You can see it's so unsatisfied that it even ripped in the center. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's mathematics meets reality. A bit of a surprise, but it encouraged us to work more with curved creases because they actually exist. So this is a series of pieces. They're actually all identical. Uh, there is 720 degrees of paper. It's like a circle that continues twice with the ends joined. And this is a series that, to our surprise, ended up at MoMA. It's in the permanent collection on permanent display. And I repeat, each one is identical. The creases are folded just a little bit more or a little bit less, and the tension creates automatically these three different shapes. So the paper wants to live in these forms. It's really, it's really amazing. Um, we've been working on, on architectural applications with a, an architect at MIT. And uh, here the idea is, how can we control what 3D forms you get? I want to get a specific thing, like a building or a pavilion or some furniture. How can I change the creases to get control over that, that form? So that's really exciting. Uh, back to the sculpture side. Right, so the original sculpture that we did with paper was modular, joining lots of pieces together. So the idea here, this is a recent show in, in Houston, is to combine these circular forms. There's two, three, or four pieces kind of joined in different key points to f make these interesting forms. So really amazing what, what control you can, you can get here. And that's the sort of quick story from the Art to the math to the art to the math to the art to the math to the art so far of pleat folding. And we have one new addition to this story, uh, a video we prepared just uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, right, this is specifically for here. And the, the idea was in the beginning you saw glass, and our latest interest has been paper. So what's the best way to bring them together? Paper is tactile, it's about touch, it's about feeling. It's a very sensitive way to make the creases. Glass blowing, you can't touch it. It's the same temperature as an erupting volcano. Well, you can not touch it, but it's high risk. <laughs> <laughs> very short so time. So the way to make glass blowing more feeling and touching is to do it blindfolded. So uh, my dad called me up. He's like, I got this great idea. Get over here with the camera right in 10 minutes. And uh, this is the, what came out of it. A quick detail that there was wet paper used to kind of almost touch the glass. That, that was the way, another connection between the two mediums. Well, I'm glad you like the ship in the bottle effect. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, and that's pretty much all we wanted to say. To summarize, uh, collaboration is really powerful. We love collaborating with each other and with lots of people. I'd be yeah. happy to collaborate with lots of people here. And we like to do it in a humorous and very fun way. I really think people should have fun with what they do. They should do what they're passionate about, as David Salison was saying earlier, because you will do it better, and it'll be more enjoyable, and you'll have a better time, a better life, and do cooler things. 
And, and learning, learning is the most important thing. You should never, ever stop learning. That's, I think, the whole point of EG. And uh, we do art, we do math, any kind of interdisciplinary stuff is fun, but most important is working with family. Thank <laughs> you.